Welcome to the eSchool of the European Society for Gene and Cell Therapy. My name is Hildegard Bühning. I'm Professor of Infection Biology of the Gene Transfer at Hannover Medical School and the current president of the ESGCT. The ESGCT is a nonprofit organization founded in 1992, thus shortly following the first gene therapy clinical trial. ESGCT is promoting fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and vaccines. Education is an important part of our mission. Besides educational session at our annual meeting, we once per year organize an ESGCT spring school. In May this year, we launched the eSchool. We are grateful to all our colleagues for supporting this initiative. They are, like our speaker today, highly recognized experts in the field of gene and cell therapy. The crown part of our lecture series is dedicated to gene and cell therapies of rare diseases, and in particular, we focus today on the liver. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Dr. Gloria gonzalez asigua Lassa. And Gloria is a member of the board of the ESGCT and the current president of the Spanish Society for Gene and Cell Therapy. She has always been focused on the development of treatments for orphan diseases, and she started her career on development of genetic vaccines against parasitic infections before entering the field of rare diseases. And developing gene therapy means that you're really working on different aspects, as for example, developing animal models, therapeutic strategies, the delivery vectors, and so on. So finally, Gloria performed the first AV uh, vector-mediated gene therapy clinical trial for a liver inherited metabolic diseases, so for acute intermittent porphyria. Since 2014, she had the gene therapy program at CIMA and coordinates the area of advanced therapy of the Institute of Biomedical Research in Navarra. Today, she will speak, as I already told you, on, on liver and as a main target for gene therapy. So Gloria, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Hildeka. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation to, uh, to give me the opportunity uh, to present uh, on this topic of uh, liver gene therapy. And uh, at the end of this uh, session, I will present part of the of the work we are we are performing here in, in CIMA. Um, so this is my my first slide um, with the title. I'm going to cover the the liver as the main target in gene therapy. And I'm a, I'm working as a researcher at CIMA, and I'm also a bibliotherapeutic CSO and, and co-founder. So for uh, you that uh, don't know where we are doing our work, uh, because uh, Pamplona is, is a very small uh, city in, in Spain, we are located in the, in the north of Spain, okay, very, very close to, uh, to France. And uh, being a small city, I think uh, we are very well known by some particular uh, fiestas, particularly the, the, the running uh, of the bulls. We are known for that. But Pamplona has also uh, beautiful places that uh, you can visit. But I have to say that I believe that the people that come and visit us uh, for work or, or as, as tourists, what they really remember after that is, uh, is, is the food. For sure that if you come here, what I can assure is that you will eat very, very well and you will remember your whole life. So I hope you also will, uh, uh, when uh, talking about Pamplona, you will, you will also think about uh, CIMA, which is a, a, a translational re research center located, as I said, in, in Pamplona. It belongs to the, to the University of Navarra and in fact, this is, is located in the, in the university campus, uh, very close to the uh, university clinic, just uh, across the road, and uh, the schools of medicine, pharmacy, biology, etc. So it's a very nice uh, environment in which you have a very close contact with both clinicians and patients and, and students. Okay, so this is where, where we work where we work on gene therapy and also 
uh, in different indication, like pathology, neuroscience, uh, cardiology, etc. So uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, in an agenda or a summary of the things I'm going to try to cover in this uh, in this uh, presentation. So we will start just with some words about the the liver. Uh, some also some information about vec vectors for gene delivery to to the liver, although. Uh, this has been already extensively covered by by previous speakers, uh, in which you can find the talks in the in the in the web on uh, just a uh, specific uh, talks on uh, adenovirus, uh, adenosuspected virus, uh, lentivirus, etc. But I'm going to try to just summarize those of one that are being used. Uh, in the liver. Then I'm going to just uh, go very fast on uh, our uh, front runner in gene therapy for uh, targeting the liver, which is uh, the hemophilia clinical trials. And at the end, I'm going to present uh, some of our, our work, the work we are doing uh, with uh, two different uh, strategies uh, for treatment of rare disease, one based on gene supplementation and another one based on, on gene editing. So uh, the liver, as I don't know if you know, but is the second major organ in the, in the body after the, the skin. So it has uh, many cells that you need to transduce when you, need, when you want to, to treat the disease, but it has uh, be, some very interesting aspects for gene therapy. One is that 10 to 15% of the whole blood volume uh, is uh, at one point in the, in the liver. So it's a very good organ if you want to uh, express a protein that needs to be secreted into the circulation. Okay, so uh, this is one thing that uh, is uh, quite interesting from the gene therapy point of view. Uh, another interesting uh, aspect of the liver is that the hepatocyte, which is the parenchymal cell of the liver, has a, a very slow turnover. So when you when you once you deliver. Uh, the, the therapeutic material, it can be in the cells during a, a, long, uh, let, the long, a long time. And also because of the characteristics and the function of the, of the liver, uh, it's a very uh, tolerogenic organ. And there are several publications showing that if you transfer a genetic material and you express a protein in this, in this organ, instead of inducing an immune response against a, a strange protein, it induces a, a tolerogenic um, a response. So this is, another as, this is another aspect that is very important uh, for gene therapy. And then uh, in relation to, to diseases, uh, um, the liver is, uh, plays a very important organ in uh, all the, the metabolism and also it's a detoxifying organ. So there are many metabolic routes that uh, only function in the liver. And for this reason, there are many diseases in which mutation that alter uh, proper functionality of a metabolic route cause a disease that uh, requires the therapeutic action to be um, uh, exert in the liver. Okay, so they are more than 400 liver uh, inherited diseases uh, described. So how we can transfer genetic material to the liver? So as I said, this, this topic has been already developing safer strategies. The, the second one uh, is uh, the associated virus that was already presented uh, by, by, by Legal. And uh, this, this virus is the, I will say, uh, the kin and the gene therapy field of the for for liver diseases because it has a very efficient liver transduction is very flexible you know that there are several uh, uh, serotypes that uh, can transduce uh, very efficiently the liver the inflammatory reaction against this vector is uh, is low if you inject low doses of of vector and uh, so far with a uh, some uh, exception is uh, the, the, the safety pro profile of this vector is very, is very good. The main limitation they have, and I will go back late, later on, 
is that the, it's a very small virus and the limited, it has a very limited cloning capacity. Or on top of that, uh, many of us, we have been infected uh, with, uh, we have been exposed to AB and we have uh, neutralizing antibodies that will prevent a proper transduction of, the, of the, the organ after system in administration. Then we have a adenovirus, uh, first generation adenovirus, uh, which is a um, replication deficient adenovirus that has a limited uh, cloning capacity. Uh, it has a very high transduction, liver transduction efficiency. It has a very stable genome, so it can be uh, easily modified in, in vitro. However, it, it provokes a, a strong inflammatory reaction, reaction in the patients. And for this reason, these are very good vectors to be used as, as vaccines or as an, an anti-tumoral agents. But the problem is that the expression is transient and it's not the best candidate to be used as a, as a, a vector for, for gene therapy of inherited disorders, for example. So uh, uh, recently, well, not, not so recently, but uh, in the field, uh, they are groups that has developed uh, vectors uh, based on uh, adeno, adenovirus, just removing all the, the adenoviral proteins and uh, can, that can be replaced by uh, exogenous material. And this vector can, um, once injected into into animals can express the, the therapeutic uh, material for, for a long time, but they have also problems on uh, manufacturability and also due to uh, inflammatory uh, reactions, okay? So uh, these are the, the vectors that can be used uh, for, the viral vectors that can be used for the treatment of liver inherited dis diseases because they are able to express the transgene for a long period of time. Um, furthermore, we have very interesting strategies based on non-viral vectors. And I, I want to bring this uh, here because uh, as uh, you will see later, uh, the best uh, results in the field of clinical trials for, um, for the liver uh, inherited diseases are based on, on the use of a, a siRNA interference as, a, as a strategy to uh, prevent the accumulation of, of toxic products and also um, targeted lipid nanoparticles that can modif modify in the surface to uh, bound to uh, hepatocyte receptors and they, they are able to introduce in the hepatocytes a messenger RNA. And as you can see here in this, in this slide, these are animals injected with uh, lipid nanoparticles containing messenger RNA. And you can see how efficiently they go to um, the liver of, of mice. And, and this is after the first administration. And although the expression is transient, you can reinject uh, those animals uh, reaching again similar levels of expression. So, I think uh, in the field of gene therapy, uh, AB vectors uh, or gene therapy vectors uh, based on, on virus are, are very powerful, but we don't have to forget about the, the, the non-viral vectors because in fact, uh, they, are, they are approaching uh, the field with a very uh, good uh, therapeutic uh, outcomes. So uh, going back to, to, the, to, the, to the vectors, as, as you know, as many of you know, the, the most, uh, uh, the vector that is uh, used uh, more frequently in the clinic uh, for liver diseases is adeno-associated vectors. And I'm going to go now to the, our experience with the uh, uh, hemophilia. As you know, hemophilia is a, is a bleeding disorder in which the, the one um, coagulation factor is, is missing. So the, the, the patient is not able to form clots properly and they has uh, bleeding uh, problems. So uh, the, the several groups has uh, developed adeno-associated vectors 
carrying the, uh, the in, in their genomes the coding sequence for the coagulation factor and targeting the liver, they were able to use the, 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 the hepatocytes as factories of these uh, coagulation factors. So uh, the first uh, gene therapy trial targeting um, the, the liver was performed with an AB0 type 2 uh, carrying factor 9. And this trial teaches us uh, many things in the, in the field. Uh, the first thing is that we can really reach the liver. We can reach the liver with an AAB. We can deliver the genetic material to, to, the, to the liver cells. And we are able to express the, the protein. As you can see in this patient, this is factor nine expression. Uh, two weeks after AAB administration, this patient has uh, detectable levels of the factor nine protein in circulation. However, this uh, assay, this, this clinical trial also show that this, uh, the administration of this AB vector resulted in a elevation of transaminase levels uh, shortly after vector administration. Four weeks after vector administration, we can detect this transaminase elevation and the disappearance of the uh, expression of the transgene. So the elimination of the therapeutic effect. Another thing that this uh, uh, trial show is that if the patient has antibodies against the, the AB uh, vector, the uh, administration of the vector results in no protein expression at all, okay? Later on, the analysis of, the, of this patient show that uh, the, the reason for the elimination of this um, uh, transgene expression and the race in transaminase was due to uh, the development of a T cell response against the AB capsid. So in the next uh, trial performed uh, with an AB8 vector, knowing or having the, this information, uh, what the, the, what the uh, researcher did was uh, as soon as they observed this elevation of transaminases, treat the patients with a pregnisolone uh, treatment to avoid the, uh, to reduce this uh, liver injury and prevent the elimination of the transduced uh, hepatocyte. And with this strategy, they were, they were able or not to completely, but to reduce the elimination of this transduced cell and allowing maintenance for a long time of the uh, recombinant protein expression. And those patients uh, were, uh, were uh, partially cured, okay? So, so these this, this studies has, has, teach, has teach us in the field of gene therapy of the liver very important things. First, that we have to pay attention to the presence of neutralizing antibodies in the patient. And in fact, in all the clinical trials in which we use a systemic administration, patients with neutralizing antibodies are, are excluded because they will not benefit for the, for the treatment. And they have also um, initiate a lot of projects in, uh, to find a way to avoid the uh, neutralizing activity of, of these antibodies. So we can, uh, all the patients that uh, has a given disease can benefit for the, for the treatment. And the other thing that they have teach us is that uh, we need to prevent the T cell response against the capsid to prevent the elimination of the hepatocyte. So in general, all the clinical trials uh, using AAB uh, has a concomitant administration of immunosuppressor agents to prevent the, the disappearance of these uh, transduced cells. So really, uh, it has been very important, these previous trials uh, for, for the field. And I think right now we are benefiting for this, uh, from these studies. And we are, um, we are um, uh, being uh, able to see very, very important uh, uh, success in the field of hemophilia as the one of the study performed by Spark 
in which the patient treated with a single dose of this vector are able to maintain therapeutic levels of this uh, protein. And this is just uh, one and other companies are showing similar results with uh, different vectors, but for the uh, same indication and also for uh, hemophilia A. So I think uh, we are very close to uh, bring these uh, therapies to the marker for the benefit of many patients that one single shot will be the cure for uh, this disease. So uh, going back to, 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 the, to the liver, uh, to diseases that are um, um, inherited diseases that are um, um, based on a liver uh, deficit, deficit, they are uh, several in which the only treatment available is liver transplantation. And uh, thinking on, on, on this, we can, we can really assume that if liver transplantation is the uh, treatment uh, for, uh, for, those di uh, for these diseases, if we are able to uh, um, correct this genetic deficit or modulate this genetic deficit in the liver will be the cure of, of the disease. Okay, so um, there are several strategies uh, for the treatment of those diseases. And as I al already uh, introduced, the, they are, uh, uh, although there are several trials uh, using AB as the therapeutic agent, I have to say that the most advanced, I mean, the one that the strategies that are already in phase three are not those ones based on AB, but uh, strategies based on the use of siRNA, like uh, for the treatment of acute intermittent porphyria, uh, primary hyperoxaluria or familiar hypercholesterolemia with really uh, interesting results. However, I, this is not really a curative treatment in the in terms in, in the in the sense that it requires a long a long life uh, treatment. Those treatment has to be repeatedly administered. While with the use of AB vectors, hopefully a single administration of an AB uh, for methylmalonic acidemia, for clear and ajar, for for uh, primary hyperoxaluria, for Wilson disease, will be uh, the, the, the cure of those patients, or at least a, a long-term um, uh, therapeutic uh, effect. I will concentrate in two of those uh, diseases, primary hyperoxaluria and Wilson disease. Uh, and I'm going to show you not the, the clinical data because we don't have but the preclinical data uh, that we have obtained in working on these diseases. So the first one is Wilson disease. And here is the, the Wilson team uh, that has performed extraordinary work in the, the preclinical development of gene therapy uh, for, for, this, um, for this disorder. And, uh, and Wilson disease, the gene therapy for Wilson, Wilson disease uh, is a vive therapeutic program. And thanks to the extraordinary work performed by the company, we are very close to bring this, uh, this uh, gene therapy approach uh, to, to the clinic. So uh, Wilson disease is, a, is an autosomic recessive disease with 30 cases per million in inhabitants. And it's caused by mutation in the ATP7B gene. The ATP7B gene uh, express a, a copper transporter protein called ATP7B. And uh, the, the deficiency in this, in this protein result in copper accumulation uh, in the liver that cause a liver disease, uh, uh, mainly um, associated with transaminase elevation and acute hepatitis, but also with time those patients develop uh, cirrhosis, but the accumulation of copper uh, in the liver 
increased copper concentration in circulation, causing and affecting different organs. Uh, one, uh, one of the most affected is the, is the brain, and those patients has uh, motor problems with involuntary movements, and also some uh, psychiatric disorders like uh, uh, personality disorders or mood disorders, okay? We also can see all their uh, uh, clinical features, but the, uh, the most important one are the, brain, the neurological and the uh, liver uh, features. So just uh, uh, going in more detail in the, the disease, uh, copper is, uh, is, uh, is necessary for life. So a patient which, uh, that has no atp 7 b that they cannot transport properly uh, copper, you cannot eliminate copper from the diet because every, every, uh, everything has copper and copper is, is necessary uh, for life. So we, we uptake copper uh, in, uh, from the diet and this copper has to, tr to, be, uh, uh, to be transported to the hepatocytes, okay? Once in the, in the hepatocyte, this copper, uh, thanks to the activity of ATP7B, is transported to the Trans-Golgi network, where it bounds to cuproproteins. One of the main cuproproteins is the ceruloplasmin that is transformed from apoceruloplasmin to the oloceruloplasmin. And this oloceruloplasmin is secreted into the circulation. So, uh, this ceruloplasmin is very important in transporting the copper to the whole body and also has an important activity in preventing oxidative reaction in, uh, in iron metabolism. Okay, so once uh, after uh, forming this oloceruloplasmin and when the levels of copper at, are very high, this copper uh, has to be always bound to proteins because free copper is highly toxic. So when there is an excess of copper, ATP7B, so the same protein, has to transfer the copper to, to intracellular vesicles that excrete this copper uh, in the bile, uh, appearing in the feces. So this is the normal and uh, the physiological uh, copper metabolism. When there is no ATP7B, the problem is that oloceruloplasmid is not formed. So cuproproteins in general are not formed and they are not, the, the ceruloplasmin is not detected in blood. Uh, um, the excess of copper, which accumulate in the cells, cannot be eliminated uh, through the bile, and it accumulates in the, in the hepatocyte, causing uh, the, the cell, cell death, and an increase of copper in circulation that is eliminated into the uh, urine. So uh, the main uh, the, uh, biomarkers of this disease are the absence of ceruloplasmin in circulation, a transaminase elevation due to liver damage, an excess of copper in urine, and excess of copper in, um, in the liver, okay? So uh, since it's a disease that uh, can be treated by, by liver uh, transplantation and ITP7B is mainly expressed in the liver, we decide to develop an AB uh, to transfer this uh, gene to the uh, hepatocytes. But we face a problem and it's because uh, the ATP7B cDNA is a quite large cDNA. It has uh, four, uh, all close to 4,500 base pairs. Okay, so when you have to introduce this cDNA and on top you have to put your promoter, your polyadenylation as a signal and the, the ITRs that are required to form the, the genome, this, uh, uh, this AB genome is uh, larger than the uh, optimal size of, uh, of a recombinant AB. Okay, so what we did was uh, to engineer this cDNA and uh, looking at the, at the ATP7B uh, protein, we found that they ha it has six uh, copper metal, metal binding site in the amino terminal region. So we decided to eliminate those uh, metal binding sites. We engineered engineer several 
uh, proteins, and we found that uh, the mini ATP 7 b protein, in which we eliminate for metal, for metal binding site, uh, remaining only the uh, five and six metal binding site was uh, active. And we decide to go ahead and compare this uh, gene, this mini gene, with the uh, wild type uh, sequence uh, to see if they, they, they were able to correct the, the disease. So uh, the first experiment we did was compare, as I said, the wild type version of the, of the gene uh, with uh, uh, the mini uh, ATP version of the gene. We use uh, two different doses of this vector, uh, a high dose of 510 to the 12 and a lower dose of 1.510 to the 12. And to test the efficacy of this vector, we use a, a Wilson disease animal model developed by uh, Dr. Esbelana uh, Lutsenko at NIH that kindly provide this, this model to us. And uh, you can see that in, this, in these animals, copper, which is a stain here in black, is accumulated in the, in the liver of this animal, uh, inducing a, a, a very dramatic uh, histological change of the liver. This is the same magnification, and you can see how the, the hepatocyte in, this liver, in those livers are huge, and the, the uh, nuclei of this uh, hepatocyte are also uh, very big. So we use in this model, we inject uh, Wilson disease female mice with these uh, vectors, and we tested seroloplasmin in serum, transaminase levels, copper in, in urine, and copper in the liver. So these are the, the, the results uh, we, we obtained. As you can see here, uh, after vector administration, uh, three months later, the transaminase levels were normal uh, in, the, in the animals treated with the with the two vectors, with the vector, with the wild type vector, with the vector expressing the wild type gene, and with the vector expressing the mini ATP 7B. So there is no liver damage in those animals three months after vector injection. We also show that uh, this treatment was able to significantly reduce copper accumulation uh, in urine. Okay, in the, in, in, after the administration of the three vectors. And very importantly, uh, they were able to um, in, uh, recover ceruloplasmin uh, activity in circulation. So this is uh, wild type animals. This is the activity in wild type animals. The ceruloplasmin activity is reduced in Wilson disease animals. And after treatment, we are able to uh, recover this uh, ceruloplasmin activity in circulation. And when we analyze uh, the concentration of copper in the liver, we found that the, the wild type version of the, of the gene was able to reduce significantly the copper accumulation in the liver if you compare with the Wilson disease animals, but still the levels are higher with the, with the uh, treatment of the wild type. And at the same dose of vector, when we use the mini ATP7B uh, gene, the reduction was even uh, better. So at the same dose of vector, it seems that the mini, ATP, mini version of the gene works better than the uh, wild type version of the, of the gene. And when we analyze uh, histologically uh, uh, the, the, the impact of this treatment, we, you can see how this is the, the Wilson disease untreated, okay? And this is the, the wild type controls. You can see how the, the, um, the treatment has reduced very significantly copper from the liver and how the histology is more similar to a wild type animal than to a, a Wilson disease untreated. So, our uh, strategy was working. The mini ATP 7B was able to really uh, control liver damage, reduce copper concentration uh, in the liver. So the next thing we did was uh, let's see uh, which is the dose of vector where we need to, to achieve this therapeutic effect. 
So we perform a dose finding uh, a study uh, in Wilson disease animals, both in, in male and in females. We analyze the same parameters as before, ceruloplasmin, transaminases, copper in urine, copper in the liver, and we perform an in situ hybridization analysis to understand how many cells we need to correct to achieve a, a therapeutic effect. So, as you can see in this slide, at the, even at the lowest uh, dose of vector, okay, we are able to uh, control liver damage, both in male and in female. Okay? So these are wild type animals in white. These are Wilson disease animals in which you can see that the levels of transaminases increase. And these are, these are animals receiving the vector. Independently of the dose, we are able to significantly reduce and control uh, liver damage. In terms of urina urinary copper excretion, you see that the, um, we see a decrease in urinary copper excretion that was dose dependent, and the same was true for the recovery of ceruloplasmin activity. So both urinary copper excretion and ceruloplasmin increase was dose dependent. But even at the lowest dose of vector use, we are able to control damage, which is very important because the disease is associated with liver damage. And uh, uh, as a consequence, those, those patients develop uh, cirrhosis. So when we analyze copper in the, in the liver, we also observe a, a reduction, a significant reduction uh, of copper at the three dose tested tested, and again, we observe a, a dose-dependent uh, effect. So as I said, we, we wanted to know how many cells we need to transduce uh, to control the disease. And for that, we analyze how many hepatocytes are expressing the, the messenger RNA for ATP7B by in-situ hybridization. And you can see that with a uh, um, a percentage lower than 15%, we are all uh, able to induce a clinic, clinical benefit in those mice because with a, a percentage of 15%, uh, transaminase levels were, were controlled. However, of course, uh, better results are obtained as, as uh, when you increase the, um, the transduction efficiency. Okay, so uh, uh, we believe that we have a, 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 a product that can really provide a, a benefit to, to, to these patients. So next, we analyze how long does this uh, therapeutic effect last? And uh, we follow animals treated at six weeks for a year. And you can see that the, the, uh, for the whole duration of the study, the transaminase levels were controlled, were similar to healthy wild-type animals, while these are the levels of, um, of Wilson disease animals. Unin, unin, uninary copper levels were controlled. They were uh, low as well as uh, the same similar levels to wild-type, sorry. And uh, the, uh, what is very important is that uh, after 40 um, weeks of age, animals and treated animals start dying while the animals that receive the treatment remain alive. So the treatment increase, improve the survival of those animals. And after sacrificing the animals and analyzing copper concentration in the liver, you see that the, the levels of copper concentration in the liver are very similar to wild types. So the next thing and, and thinking on bringing this uh, um, therapy to the clinic, we need to demonstrate that the gene therapy is able to restore copper metabolism in those patients. And as I already explained, uh, the proper physiological elimination of copper is uh, the elimination of copper through the bile and not uh, through the urine. So uh, it has to uh, uh, excrete the copper into the bile, and this will be uh, eliminated into the feces. So to test 
if uh, gene therapy is able to do this, what we uh, perform is a, a radio copper analysis in animals receiving uh, the gene therapy vector. So this is the wild type animals that receive uh, copper 64. Um, and you can see that after uh, copper 64 administration and PET analysis, copper appear in the liver, but 24 hours after copper administration, we can see uh, copper excretion into, uh, into the intestine associated to the stools. While in Wilson disease, the uh, copper is retained in the, in the liver. However, if you analyze the same in animals that has received the, the, our therapeutic vector, although again, you can see that copper it goes to the liver, we can uh, recover this copper excretion and copper ap appearing feces. So when we analyze this, uh, this radioactivity signal into the feces, uh, harvesting a stool for 24, 48, and 72 hours, while not, uh, we cannot detect copper 64 or very uh, low amount of copper 64 in feces in, in Wilson disease and treated animals, uh, we can detect the elimination of copper in animals that has received the therapeutic effect. So we believe we are, we are ready to, to start the, the, the clinical trial of, for the treatment of Wilson disease because we have demonstrated that uh, the genetic transfer of this mini ATP7B is able to control uh, liver damage, uh, reduce copper excretion and, 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 and accumulation of copper in, in urine and, and in the liver, and we are recovering a physiological copper uh, excretion. So, uh, and, and, and in fact, this mini atp 7 b showed a better uh, therapeutic efficacy than the, the AB carrying the wild type uh, version. And uh, very important, uh, the transduction of approximately 15% uh, of the hepatocytes is enough to uh, improve the, the disease and to control uh, liver damage. And we observe that this uh, therapeutic effect is maintained for, for one year. So uh, next, hopefully we will uh, soon start uh, testing this, this product in, in, in patients and we will be able to, to improve the, the, the life of a Wilson disease uh, patient. So uh, uh, changing the, the, the topic, now I'm going to, to um, comment on results and on the uh, preclinical studies uh, we have performed for the treatment of primary hyperoxaluria. And in the, this case, we have used a, a completely different strategy based on, on gene editing. And this work has been performed by, by, by really very talented people in, in the lab, Nerea Zabaleta, uh, Laura Torella, uh, and Miren, with the support of the, uh, of the team, and in collaboration with a very important uh, a researcher, uh, a, a thema, an outside thema, uh, like Juan, Ro, uh, Juan Rodriguez Ro, uh, um, Madot, and uh, one of the major experts in uh, hyperoxaluria, which is uh, Eduardo Salido in, in Tenerife. So in uh, primary hyperoxaluria is an ultra rare disease and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it affects, it's an error of uh, glycol, 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 gly, glyoxylate metabolite, metabolism and it's also a, a autosomal recessive disorder associated with mutation in AXT uh, gene that codify for a, a, the AGT protein. So this uh, protein is mainly expressed in the, in the, in the liver and uh, the, as, the absence of this uh, protein uh, results in oxalate accumulation. But it's not the liver, which is the is not the liver, the main affected organ, but the kidney, because uh, 
the uh, uh, liver uh, eliminate the the oxalate um, excrete the oxalate to the to the blood and it goes to the to the kidney where oxalate accumulate and form stones so this patient uh, uh, suffer from from kidney failure due to this oxalate accumulation and and the the in most in the most severe cases the only treatment for those patient is a, a kidney uh, a liver transplantation so um, what uh, we hypothesize is that um, um, if uh, the absence of AGT results in this glyoxylate accumulation that is transformed uh, to, to oxalate, and this is the cause of the disease, if we are able to reduce the uh, production of glyoxylate, uh, we will reduce the formation of these kidney stones. And one possibility to perform this is uh, uh, reducing the activity or the expression of the uh, glycolate oxidase. So you reduce uh, glycolate uh, oxidase activity, you reduce the, um, sorry, glyoxylate formation, and uh, the uh, patient will accumulate glycolate. And so we, you might think, why you want to change one disease uh, for other disease? For, for other disease, why you prefer to accumulate glycolate and then accumulate oxalate? The reason is that glycolate can be easily eliminated through the urine because it does not form uh, oxalate. And this is a product that is not essential. At least this is what we learn from studies performed by one of our uh, by, by one of our collaborator Eduardo Salido that performed the following experiment. Uh, he um, uh, developed a, a, a primary hyperoxaluria animal model based on a knockout of AGX gene, and he crossed these uh, knockout mice with an, uh, a knockout mice uh, that does not express the the GO. So an uh, animal model in which the HA uh, deficient in HAO1. And when they cross these mice and they generate these no double knockout mice, what they found is that uh, the AGST uh, knockout mice, the primary hyperoxaluria mouse, accumulate oxalate. But when you cross these animals with the uh, GO uh, deficient mice, this oxalate accumulation disappears. Of course, both animals accumulate uh, glyco um, glyo glycolate, but uh, those animals were perfectly healthy. Okay, so this is uh, this is uh, an strategy. Let's reduce glycolate. Gly um, um, let's reduce the the production of the substrate to form oxalate by uh, reducing the activity of uh, uh, GO. And this is the strategy, in fact, that, the, that the, has been used by uh, two companies, uh, Dicerna and, uh, and Nylan. And I have already introduced you that uh, Nylan is in phase three uh, trials using uh, SIRNA against uh, HAO1. And uh, with this strategy, as you can see, you reduce oxalate accumulation transiently and increase glycolate accumulation. But the, the, this strategy, as has been shown already in clinical trials, is safe, mm -hmm. but requires lifelong treatment. So what we did was uh, taking advantage of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology, we designed two guides uh, against uh, HAO1 gene, the guide one and the guide two. And to deliver this uh, CRISPR-Cas system together with the guides, we develop uh, an AB uh, genome in which Cas9 expression is controlled by uh, liver-specific promoters. And in the same genome, we introduce the guides under the control of U U U6 promoter. So these uh, uh, guides target the HAU1 gene. And animals with a primary hyperoxaluria 
were treated with uh, saline, with a vector expressing Cas9 but no guides, uh, or with the vector carrying the Cas9 plus guide one or guide two. And the first thing we did was analyze uh, the efficacy of gene editing by surveyor and by type. And as you can see here, the, uh, uh, we, we were able to test and to um, uh, observe by surveyor that both the guys uh, was, were able to introduce indels into the HAU1 uh, gene and different products were obtaining depending on the guide we use, guide one and guide two, and these are three independent uh, animals. And the, the, our controls, in the controls, you are not able to observe this uh, in the formation. When we analyzed by type, the, uh, after sequencing, we analyzed by type the frequency of genome uh, editing. With the guide one, we observe 40% of editing and the, with the guide two, uh, we were over uh, 50%. So what is important is to know what happened with the protein. And as you can see here, when we analyzed by Western blood geo expression, all the animals that were treated with the guide one or the guide two, the protein expression completely disappeared from the, from the liver. And this was corroborated by immunohistochemistry these are, uh, this is an animal treated with saline or with a Cas9 with, with no guide. And these are the animals uh, we try treated with the guide. So we cannot detect uh, protein expression. So uh, the next question is, this really result in a, in a therapeutic uh, effect? I mean, is this really preventing oxalate accumulation uh, in, a, in primary hyperoxaluria uh, mice? So to test that, we uh, inject animals with the vectors. And four months later, we challenged those animals with ethylene glycol because ethylene glycol uh, uh, increased oxalate concentration and accumulation uh, in those animals. And we analyzed this oxalate accumulation uh, in a 24-hour unit. So uh, this is uh, the data we obtained. This is oxalate levels. First thing, what we observe is that four months after treatment, the animals that has been treated with the uh, guide one and the guide two has lower levels, but they have lower oxalate levels in urine than the animals and treated or treated with a Cas9 control. And, uh, and after challenge, the levels of oxalate increase in untreated animals and control treated animals, but uh, only a very low uh, increase we were observed in animals treated with the uh, guide one and the guide two. And those levels were very similar to healthy wild type animals. So the treatment is working because it's preventing this oxalate accumulation. Uh, another point is that, as expected, and I have already introduced, you, we will expect an increase in glycolate levels due to the um, inhibition of this geo uh, expression, and this is what happened. Basically, we have higher glycolate levels in those animals, and those levels clearly increase in, uh, in, treat, in animals treated with the guide one and the guide two. So uh, the, the treatment is, is working. Uh, the animals are perfectly healthy. We analyze the kidneys and the kidneys show no, no, no pathology. However, as a, gene, as, a, as a gene editing strategy, one important thing is of course, the safety of the treatment. And the safety of the treatment is, is also associated to uh, the of target effect of the strategy. So we analyze both the on target and the off target effect. And as I already showed by other strategies, uh, by next generation sequencing, we were able to uh, detect um, a percentage of in the formation of 40 to 50 uh, percent of the sequence in individual animals. When we analyze in details this modification, 
we observe a different patterns depending on the guide. In the guide two, we observe mainly in, in the, uh, the lesions of uh, two uh, nucleotides, while when using the guide one, we observe insert insertions of, um, of, of one nucleotide. So this is uh, the, the, the on target of the effect that we are observing that surprisingly is like very homogeneous, more homogeneous than we were anticipating. And then we analyzed uh, the off target effects of this uh, uh, strategy. And for that, we uh, uh, perform an in, -sequel, in silico analysis to predict, to predict potential of target regions. And we select seven, the, 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 uh, the seven sequences with highest score based on each guide. And we analyze the uh, potential uh, uh, gene editing or gene modification in those of target sequence. And as you can see here in this table, the, we didn't see any uh, or a modification of this of target of seven of targets uh, sequence by the guide one or by the uh, one two. If you compare with animals receiving saline, animals receiving the cas the control cas nine uh, in both cases. So um, other strategies need to be applied to for for a better understanding of the targets effect. But so far. We didn't. Uh, we have been not able to see uh, additional modification or some um, uh, signs of uh, toxicity in those animals. So, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to to finish just with the with the last results we we have obtained uh, because after seeing that the this uh, that the addition with these uh, two guides was so. Uh, um, precise and uh, and those guides were close uh, to to the other, very close, very very uh, nearby in the genome. We decided to test if we can introduce precise deletion or, see, or using the two guides at the same time. So what we did was administer uh, mice with the two guide with the two vectors together and analyze. The, the modification in the genome by uh, next, generation, next generation sequencing. And we performed this, this study in collaboration with uh, the group of Jose Carlos Segovia uh, at CMAT. And what we were able to, to see is that uh, uh, 90, more than 98% of the modification we observe are precise deletion of 64 base pair. So cutting with the two um, uh, guides, we are able to, in to introduce a, a, a really precise modification, which uh, from our opinion, it introduced uh, like uh, uh, um, um, from the safety perspective, it, it's a, a, a better level of uh, modification. And uh, so these are uh, quantitatively the, the results. We obtain a similar uh, gene addition as uh, when we are using the, uh, the two guides uh, separately, so close to 50%. Uh, most of them, as I said, are a perfect deletion. And of course, the results in the elimination of the protein from the animals and the elimination of the a significant reduction of the uh, messenger RNA. So now we have to test uh, again if this, is, this uh, strategy has a therapeutic effect, but uh, we believe that this is uh, a safer strategy than just inducing um, uh, cutting with, uh, one, with one guide. So the conclusion from this part is that um, um, the CRISPR-Cas system to treat PH1 gene is efficient. It shows short and long-term efficacy, although I only show to you the long-term effect. And HAO1 gene disruption based on preclinical, on this preclinical data, and also on the fact that 
that a patient that has mutation in HAU1 has no any associated pathology, we believe this is a, a, could be, could be a, a therapeutic strategy. So just uh, to finish, uh, uh, this is the, the um, gene uh, therapy uh, group at CIMA, working in different indication with different vectors, but uh, really a very, very nice group of people before the pandemic, so no mask. And I want to thank all the people that has been, uh, co that has collaborated to us. I didn't put names because uh, we have so many collaborators that I'm, I'm not don't want to forget anybody. And uh, um, I want to thank uh, uh, the, the patient association because of their support. The Foundation Opera Moral Art and the uh, Oxalosis and Hyperoxaluria uh, Foundation. And I think with that, I am done. I'm finished. Thank you very much, Gloria, for this wonderful talk. A lot of information, great results, and we have already a number of questions waiting for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I just start with the first one, and it's Kanua Das. And the question, what is the efficiency of AV8 uh, transduction? As we know, human body has uh, antibodies against AV. I, well, I don't know if they, these are two questions. I, I mean, in the um, the transduction efficiency in mice of AB8 is very high. I mean, uh, with uh, those of uh, in a in a C57 background, the transduction efficiency with uh, those over uh, uh, five ten to the twelve pgs per can reach more than thirty percent of the of the pathocytes. So. This is in mice. If you are asking me about the transduction efficiency in human, we don't have this, uh, this uh, information uh, or the information we have is very limited. And uh, um, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know the transduction efficiency of any patients, but I'm, I'm sure it's lower than in mice because of the, the results we have already seen from hemophilia in, in clinical trials. And regarding the, the antibodies, sorry, uh, Hildegard, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just wanted also to point out that it is not easy to, to really get the information about the transduction efficacy in human liver, of course, because of the question of biopsies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yes, of course. And, and uh, regard, but that I think when well, uh, I think uh, Free uh, Natwani has performed some biopsies, but I don't, I have no right now on top of my mind the, the data. But uh, uh, and, and regarding the, the neutralizing antibodies, that's true. They are, they are, they are patients, and I mean, uh, that has neutralizing antibodies that will block. But it is still is a percentage of the population. Not everybody has antibodies. So you will select those patients that right now they don't have antibodies. Um, the second one is it's more a congratulations. So it's from Mahindra Kayaha. I hope I pronounce this correctly from uh, Takeda International. It says, thanks for your nice talk. Your work in the area of Wilson and other diseases is really admirable. Good luck with um, your VIVAT clinical trial for Wilson. Um, so the next real question is from Gracia Kams. Um, also thanking you for the great talk. And then do you think that the elimination of the four kappa binding domains to generate the mini ATP7B vector could have any um, uh, ATP7B function impairment? Um, we have a study um, in deep the, the, the functionality of these uh, four metal binding sites. Uh, uh, they have uh, this this metal binding has on has been reported to have some regulatory function uh, over the the the, the um, transport capacity of ATP7B, 
but uh, but it's true that the that the, at least from our studies we we are not observing any impairment in the correct functionality of ATP7B because we have ceruloplasmy information, so meaning that the the protein is able to to transfer the copper to the, the um, so yeah Gloria mm -hmm. can you can you maybe repeat uh, the last sentence at least on my um, I didn't get the whole okay sentence. so yeah yeah we 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 uh, we were already aware of this but I think our data showing that we are able to recover ceruloplasmin activity in circulation and uh, elimination of copper through the feces. So we are restoring the proper copper metabolism is telling you that the protein is... Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question is uh, also concerning the AV0 types. And so will there be any difference in the effect when using another zero type, and which one is better? Um, in mice, I mean, we have used two different zero types in, in our animal model. We have used AV8 and AV and KT, and we didn't observe differences in terms of therapeutic efficacy. But I have to say that those two vectors uh, are very similar in transducing the mouse liver. I don't know what's going to happen when we go to the to the patients. So I, I hope we can we are able to transduce at least 15% of the pathocytes we are so we are able to control the progression of the disease. Yeah, and I mean also the, the choice of the serotype is um, is really a difficult question, right? Because you see differences in the uh, bet between species. Mm -hmm. And we may also have to mention and that was also in the AV talks that there are engineered caps that's also developed. So let's see. Mm -hmm. So the next question from Chiara Simoni. Thank you for your talk. And concerning AV safety, have you looked at the immune response to AV and have you checked for integrations? Mm -mm. We have checked antibody response against AV, but we only um, we have been able to see uh, human immune response, but you know that uh, in mice, uh, uh, there is no, I mean, we didn't detect the cell response. Uh, and we didn't, we didn't check for integration. Um, the last question I see at the moment is from Ruda Brass or Stockholm University. Excellent topic and presentation how to avoid the effects of ne uh, neutralizing antibodies in mice. That's the first one. I repeat this later. And regarding ATP7B uh, gene function, is there a mitochondrial parameter that should be addressed as well in the disease? Okay. So starting with the neutralizing antibodies in mice, how to yeah. avoid this? Yeah, well, in, in mice, um, well, mice are naive for, for AB, so we, we, we generate neutralizing antibodies, but there is no inhibition of of the I mean the, the the animals they don't have antibodies when we inject the vector but as you know there are now several strategies to to eliminate uh, antibodies against AB I think the 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 use of these uh, IgG depleting enzymes uh, coming from 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 bacteria, it sounds really interesting, no? Uh, IgG degrading enzymes that can eliminate transiently the presence of, of neutralizing antibodies in patient will be a, a great, a great uh, a approach if, if they eliminate, uh, they, they, they reduce the levels enough to be able to transduce the, uh, the liver. In, in mice, you, you don't face this problem. Uh, at least uh, if you don't do a second rejection, which is uh, in our case is not necessary because we have long-term therapeutic effect. Yeah. The second part of the question concerned if there is a mitochondrial, par mitochondrial yeah. parameter of 8 yeah. 7 b 
-hmm. Yeah, in fact, we, we, I didn't show, but we have some, we performed some studies because the, the uh, Wilson disease, the mitochondrial uh, does not work properly. So we have tested for mitochondrial functionality. And what we have observed is that with the treatment, we recover a proper uh, mitochondrial functionality. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Thanks, Gloria. These were all the questions I have received so far. And if you give me the next slide, please. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so first of all, I really would like to thank you again, Gloria, for this wonderful talk. I would like really to thank also our audience for the live discussion. And I would like to invite you for next week's talk, which is from a TST2. And he would speak about gene and cell therapies for epidemiolosa bullosa. So bye-bye. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you.